Everybody smile, you're on Candy Camera now. So I want to welcome you to the Massive Masters Wednesday case study. As you know that we meet every Wednesday night, we provide some educational material, some time for Q&A and networking. We always appreciate our regulars that show up and we'll get it started here. Today's topic is the triple net construction. And as, as you, all of you guys have heard us talking about it, that as an investor, uh, both from the active side and the passive side, we need to build a portfolio. And the portfolio has to have a different type of assets, different locations with the different time horizons. I get three things that you balance, right? So you're active all the time. Uh, so last three years was a tough time. Last two years was a tough time for all of us, but it does not mean that we stop investing. Uh, you continue to do so, so you average out at the end of the day. So from our transaction portfolio perspective, uh, this is we shared before, uh, we underwrite all the time. We invest sometimes from the LP perspective. We also do JP, uh, in a GP perspective. And then we also all the time share in this uh, webinar, the myth versus the reality, right? School of hard knocks, what happens? And as I talk you through the second, the next 15 minutes or so, I'll give you one of the projects that we're working on in Houston area, one of the four construction projects, and as and how many times we have optimized the project plan and what happened as we have developed the project. So on that note, Massive as a team, uh, we have done over 343 transactions, more than that. On the land side, we have bought a little over 150 land tracks, a little over 100 single family, 10, uh, 10 industrial, and then we have five uh, retail development and lots of single family space. As you know, I think it's more than that. It's about, I'm uh, sorry, 100 right here existing and the 20 new development. And we have done over 70 investment into multifamily segments. So from, from our team perspective, as you know, it's just not the one way. It's, a, it's a many different ways you can create the deals. And again, not everything is for everybody, but everybody got a style. And then you look at the property types, the asset types and the location, match your style and you continue to the investments. And yes, I lost money in three deals. That strike is not bad. Okay, so let's let's get into the uh, new development. So what I will do in the next two slides, I'll walk you through a process flow, what happens typically in a new development. It's a lot, but I'll just walk you through. And then I'll give an example how that plays out uh, in, in real life. Okay, so this is a very genetic work, uh, workflow. Uh, to what happens on the top left, you know, we have an inception of a project. We have investment hypothesis. We have a piece of tract, or we believe something is going to happen in the in a given neighborhood. Then we go buy an asset, right? And we have an end product in mind usually. When we buy land, we kind of sort of uh, should have an understanding that what we are going to build on top of the land, right? And then we do scoping, which is you figure out your team design. That means that what type of team you need. If that's a multifamily. The skill set required for the deal team is different than if it's retail. It's a different than a, in a flex space, right? So you look at that. Then you have a generic idea what the scope and a schedule looks like. Uh, after that, you, you start getting some numbers around it. So hypothesis, scoping, and putting some soft cost and hard cost as you go. Then you get into the design. This is where everything gets locked in. It's a very hard place to come in. Once you get over the design side of it, you are locked in, right? You, because you start spending time and the money that really escalates. Once the design concept is ready, you take your team, go to city. Uh, once the city stamps it, you come to construction, you lease up and you exit. That's that's typically the process, right? You, you, you can go through the whole process pretty fast or it's a long term. Typically for new development, by the time you start to lease up, it's about three years or so. Um, I mean, between two and three years, that's what usually almost everything goes. If, if you do a smaller one, uh, smaller retail, or let's say less than 50,000, you could be done in two years. Houses are you know, you know, faster. So smaller the footprint, faster it is. Longer the footprint, you know, uh, more you have to stay in. And then from the team perspective, we always say, hey, when a team does a deal, Make sure the team has a know-how. Someone in the team or the team collectively as a whole could say, I have done that before. I'm doing it again. And then the network, we all, I mean, this is a big deal. Um, we always say, look, test your team with the two to three X of your loan size. Someone has to go on mute if possible. Trevor, would you help me out there? Yeah, trying to Thank here. You. Okay, so... And then uh, this is also because because you don't want to shop around for a team and a team and a team. You would like to have a team 
that can be there for you for deal number two, three, four, five, because you know building a team takes time and you get the more out of the team when you do a project two and a three. And the team also should have a liquidity between three to six months because not all projects are perfect. Nothing goes sideways, but the team needs to be strong enough to have three to six months of working capital in there. May not be you, but somebody is in your team. And remember on the development side, risk money in place. That means money, some of the money that we put in, uh, they may not come back if the if project doesn't go beyond an estimation, right? The scoping may or may may or may not take money. So that's that's in general. And then if you look at the time and the money perspective, uh, so this this is a mostly time. You don't need uh, money. You don't have to spend the money. It's, it's more of a know-how. Scoping, that's where you start reaching out to a civil engineer, architect, and you know that's where you start with some money. And when you get into the budgeting and the performance of cost, you need to engage a bigger team. So you need more money. Then here, it, it, it's all money right here. When you get to the lease up, it's mostly time. You already spend the time, you already spend the money, building is done. Hopefully your interest rate and reserve is already covered here. And then when we exit, it takes a little bit of time to do the closing, then you get your money back, right? So money in all the way, it's money back out. So now going back, right? It It is, uh, we always say, look, um, the maturity of the real estate is when you go develop. That's where the maturity happens. That's where you'll see most of the mature company, they have a development arm. And now uh, it could be a gold mine or it could be a minefield, depending on how you take a look at it. So I'll show you how it could have been a minefield for us and how we avoided that and create a version of the, uh, the gold mine per se. Right. Oh, uh, on that note, as we go, please drop your questions to the chat. We'll cover at the end. And you know, as usual, absolutely no worries at all as we go through. Okay. All right, so uh, let me show an example. This is an example one. We have four construction projects uh, right now we're active on. One of them, it's, a, it's in Houston, uh, close to uh, Bush Airport, uh, Beltway 8 uh, and 45 area. And so we call it Houston Industrial on the top right. This is your understanding. When we came into this project, uh, the first thing we have done, we, we bought this land for about a million. It's about 10 acres. Our plan was to hold it for two to three years. Then we exit one and a half million. And you know, the profit was half a million dollars in two to three years. It was purely a land play. As we came in, what we have done, we built a relationship with a couple of brokers over time because we have done some industrial. We called and asked, hey, how is the industrial play out in that area? He did a pro bono work for this particular project because we gave him a lot of other projects. And he said, look, Shreyer, uh, if you wanna do an industrial project, do three buildings, and it got some yard space right between, and then you do it. That's all we knew, right? We bought this as a purely land perspective. Then we said, okay, we bought this, market is kind of sort of you know, going in a different spot. What do we do next? We have time, we have two to three years and all the time. Here things, I have an asterisk here. I bought this from a wholesaler who is also a broker. And he took a commission of $70,000 because he got the deal. And that's also because we had to close this property in less than three weeks. Uh, that was possible because we had a couple of friends. We made some phone calls. We built the team. Everybody pitched in. We got this deal from the angle of speed and then broker took a commission. Long way of saying, look, there is, as you take a look at it, there's a lot of different angles that you can use to come into the play. Uh, so I start thinking about how you can get engaged. And you, know, you don't have to do this development. You can find the deal or you can do a part of it. You can provide the balance sheet. You can raise the money. There's a lot of different ways to do it. And that was one of the examples. The broker took a nice $7,000 check, made his year for that year, and he was done. Now, as we got into it, we say, you know what? That's fine. Let's go explore a little more. So unknown for us when we bought this land, the flood and the water containment and the sewer line, we didn't know. We said, we're buying just as a piece of land. Appreciation will kick in. We bought a 15, 20% savings from the market. So overall I have a 30, 40% spread. So 1 million to one and a half million dollars over the course of two years, number played out, right? We bought this. All right, so let's go to the phase two. So as we had time, we said, let's go investigate a little more. So this was same project, different layout. Here, we didn't know what the footprint of the building would look like. We had three buildings and that was it. That was 75,000, so 75. Right here, we said, okay, you know what? Let's put four buildings in there. 
And then because we, we dug out a little more here, we understood the water requirement, we understood this uh, septic tank or the, the sewer requirement, this particular property we found out utilities are halfway there or two thirds of the way there. They have power and they have water, but they don't have sewer line. The sewer line is somewhere down here. This is an ETJ and city of Houston will not bring you the, um, the sewer line. It's gonna cost you millions of dollars to bring it. So all of a sudden, our business plan on the development goes into the industrial only because less bathrooms, less bathrooms, less septic requirement. That means I could have a septic system and still I could get away with it, right? All of a sudden the utility set the stage for what we can develop. So phase two, we did another development. We said, okay, let's, let's optimize. Instead of three buildings, we put in four buildings right there. And then it was same. $1 million, we started spending some money because we brought in the civil, we hired them, we had an invoice to go out. Then we said, okay, let's look at the industrial space, 75 to 80,000, we didn't know the exit, we didn't know the profit. So that was uncertain for us. And also we did not know the demand of the industrial. And on top of that, we did not know whether it's a really, really high ceiling or it's an okay ceiling that you come in. Do I need to have a crane hanger or do I need to not have a crane hanger? And that's where we started engaging with the other brokers by that time, some of the unknowns were flood, water, and sewer line from there before. Then the parking requirement came in. And then the industrial demand came in. What we did, we had a couple of folks who have done industrial before from Realty One. He came on board. He said, Shariar, if you hire me for a certain amount of time, I can do the analysis for you. He did the analysis. He said, there is a demand of one tenant, 90,000 square foot, and you're done. But for that, you have to build the design certain way where you have to elevate the whole building. So you need to have tracking spot and the whole, and a truck has to do a 90, a whole bunch of other stuff. So what we start is that pure large industrial one tenant is not the play. This is a mix between you know, that and something else. By that time, we figured out the water. So we knew the, you know, the pond we have to have, whether it's a wet pond versus a dry pond and how we're gonna lay out the, the water. And then we also paid money to get the slope of the property. It slopes from left to right. Um, Just a couple weeks ago. West to east. Oops. And then, so by that time we, we solved everything, right? So iteration two, it's like a not here, not there. We didn't know the exit because remember everything that we buy has an exit. Without an exit, we, we don't know. And, and then we decided to push that forward. Then this is what happened. We said, let's do the take three. This is our plan three. Same land, same uh, industrial. And then the plan was the industrial plus a retail. Some of the feedback that we had from Realty One and some of the other partners, what we have seen or they have done, they put a retail space in the front. This is a retail empty zone. There's a middle school, so it's an elementary school, but built right on the uh, east side of it right around here, brand new. And there is no retail spot except a donut shop here. So we looked at the traffic demand and then it's about 16,000 cars per day. And there wasn't a retail, all of a sudden retail shows up. And then we did a blended of retail and a pond. So instead of the pond being at the front, it's a water feature. We said, we're gonna bring it back. So you can pull over, get to the retail, get to the flex space, drive and go here. From here to here, it's quite a bit of distance. So it doesn't become an eyesore industrial versus retail. And that seems to be the optimal model for that location. And then when we do the financial modeling, re industrial, it's about $12 to $13 a square foot plus triple net. On the retail side, it's about $24 a square foot. So you kind of do the good blending. And we thought this was a good um, way of looking at the project. And we get more square footage, 90. And then a split between a retail and industrial. So I can do phases. And construction price, by that time, we hired a, a construction company. We hired a civil engineer. We hired an architect. And we brought in some um, brokerage who, uh, who are specializes in industrial retail and retail space retail. So put together, we knew that if uh, this project will be in and out about two and a half, three years, roughly four to $5 million of economic profit that we could generate for the GP team. And by that time, hey, we, we identified the flood and water thing, sewer line, the parking, the industrial demand, the retail demand, and the construction financing. We had everything scored away. And that's where, that's, where, that's where we are now with this project. And then the wrench in the process happened. We got an LOI for $1.9 million. 
So that's the beauty of, of development. When we came about all the way in, we came in as a land, we have a lot of discovery. It was a gold mine, sorry, it was a, it was a minefield, right? I didn't, we didn't know the water and the septic and, and sewer line and the ETJ and the demand of it. But then we played from the angle of resource. Our friends from two of the other partners, CBRE and REI and partners, they came in, they gave us an idea. We reached out to real to one and said, how do you do get, you know, what do you do? They gave us a cost analysis, how to go about it. Then we went to their architect and said, look, Realty One has done 30, 40 of these projects. So we went to the same architect shop and I said, look, you don't have to think, just help us. We blended that in and then we spent hours to figure out what the best way to park it. And all of a sudden you have an optimal project. And then we said, look, we're going to test the market, right or wrong. We went to market, one of the brokers said, sure, why don't you, why don't you go to market? We went to market and then there was LOI pending, just came about. Uh, they want to buy this, and also they want to buy the property on the south, which we don't own. But all of a sudden, you could build a project that uh, that has good economic profit, even though it's it's a it's a downturn. And then your team and everything else recurs out, and you can still continue to do the deal in this market on top of all the all the news that you hear. So that's all I had. I want to give you a quick and you know, down and dirty example and how to go about it. Uh, so going back uh, to finish that out, we are in the design phase, we are finalizing it. And so we'll continue to move this project forward. And if someone comes out, buys that out from, and buys that project from us, let it be, but we're not stopping. So you'll see a massive, we'll talk about this project as we go.